All right. So this is. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate um, you being here. Um, from one Canadian to another. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, uh, we're fellow Canadians. And um, can you um, introduce yourself to our, our audience and let us know uh, what your expertise are? Sure. So my name is Phil Gursky. I'm a retired intelligence analyst uh, living in Ottawa, Canada. I spent 32 years uh, in the Canadian intelligence community, both in signals intelligence and for the working for the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. Uh, when I was with in signals intelligence, I was actually a Farsi Arabic linguist focusing on the Middle East. And then when I moved to CSIS, I became a specialist in Islamist extremism and more importantly, Canadians who thought that joining Al Qaeda or being inspired by Al Qaeda and later Islamic State was a good idea. So I was part of an investigative team that tried to figure out why they were doing this and most importantly, trying to stop them before they actually planned acts of terrorism either in Canada or outside of Canada. And I've been retired from the security service since 2015. And since that time, I've written five books on terrorism, working on a sixth, and have done hundreds of podcasts, thousands of blogs, lots of media interviews. So just uh, really still involved in trying to understand what terrorism is all about. That is extremely impressive. Uh, wait, so I thought you, you only speak Farsi. You, you also speak Arabic? Well, again, I, 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 the job didn't require me to learn how to speak. It required me to learn how to read. So mm. I could read Arabic and Farsi fluently. But uh, my Farsi was always better than my Arabic. I always found Farsi easier because it's an Indo-European language versus a Semitic language. And I, I, and I taught linguistics at university for 15 years part time. So I understand how languages function. So to me, being a, a native English speaker, an Indo-European language is just that much simpler than a Semitic language. Arabic is one of the most difficult languages to learn. I know because we were forced in Iran to learn mm. Arabic in school, but the only thing we learned how to do is how to pass the exams, not really <laughs> necessarily how <Yeah>. to <laughs> communicate. And I, I remember all of us in school used to hate having to learn Arabic. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, we didn't take it seriously. I mean, we, we aced the exam, but we can, I can't speak Arabic, even though I aced every single one of my Arabic exams. But I wish well, I took it more seriously. Well, it's kind of like the situation in Canada, right? I mean, beginning when I was a child, so, you know, I'm much older than you are. Um, French language education in English Canada didn't begin until the 1970s. Mm -hmm. And I believe it was like I was in grade six, I think, when I had to start learning French. We hated learning French because we were forced to learn French. And now, nowadays, it's more accepted. There are a lot more bilingual Canadians. My two, my two daughters are fluently bilingual, for example. But for my generation, it's like, Ew, I don't want to take French. I'd, I'd rather go, you know, play outside. Yeah. Who's, you know, why am I, I, I grew up in a small town in southwestern Ontario with like two and a half people who spoke French. Why was I learning French? It was a waste of my time. Actually, right. I, I, I probably could have learned Farsi at that time and met more Iranians where I was living than French speaking people. So whenever you're forced to do something, it's always a pain and people tend to reject it or, or resist against it. Yeah. And it's that that is there with in, in Iran, but also added to that the fact that the people that I was mostly uh, surrounded by and grew up with were more liberal type people in mm. Iran, and they also had this resentment of having to learn something that is Islamic, you know, and yeah. the fact that is like not, you know, Iranian, you know, this foreign, you know, invasion of Iranian yeah. culture, and so that that resentment being forced on yeah. them. That adds to that fact that they um, just uh, not, you know, also learning so to the fact that they're learning something that they think they will never be useful in their lives yeah. ever. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and also, I mean, Persian culture is very strong, right? Persian culture is millennia older than Arab culture. I mean, the Persian Empire stems back to thousands of years BC, right? And I think that they, were, they probably felt that there was an imposition on their own, their own culture, which was much older. Uh, and, and Persians are very, are very proud about their culture, right? They're an ancient a bit civilization. Too <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> a little bit arrogant sometimes, yeah. but, uh, but I, mean, I mean, you know, saying it I mean, very plainly, they are the planets, one of the planet's oldest civilizations. It's, it's as simple as that. Yeah, but I do tend to think, um, I don't know if this is accurate to say, but I think that a lot of the focus on the past is because of the failures of the present. <laughs> <laughs> but every, every culture does that, right? It's, right. Look, at the, look at the jihadis. They're going back to the seventh century because they think that, you know, the Prophet Muhammad and the first four caliphs were the pinnacle of Islam. 
And this is why they're trying to get, this is why the Islamic State recreated the caliphate, because they thought if we go back to the caliphate, everything will be hunky-dory and we'll be the masters again instead of the slaves. That's, I mean, every culture does that. There's always a, a, a utopian past in which nothing was wrong, everybody got along, and we were the best. <laughs> And it, 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 it's, a, it's a misinterpretation of history, but every single culture does it. Right. And there's this hope that you could go back to it for some. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. And, I mean, and um, the, the Muslims are doing that, wanting to go back to the past. And the Turks are doing that when it comes to yes. wanting to go back to the Ottoman Empire era. Yes. And the Persians are doing that. Indians are doing that. Like, yeah. yes. yes. Under, <laughs> under Modi with the uh, Hindu. No, you're right. Hindu extremism in India is, is very, very worth. Actually, I wrote, I wrote a whole chapter on Hindu extremism in my latest book, When Religion Kills, uh, I, I get really worried about what Erdogan's doing in Turkey. He's right. trying to basically go back to, as you said, the Ottoman Empire, which was dissolved in, what, 1924? Uh, yeah. You know, you can do, you can make things better without hearkening back to something that happened 1,400 years ago. You so can you, make your life better now. Your book is called When Religion Kills. So you yeah. are actually not dismissing the role of religion in this kind of in these behaviors. Oh, not at all. In fact, I fought. I fight against constantly people who say uh, it's. You know, so when I was working for CSIS, so the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, we'd go out and have talks with with people, just ordinary Canadians, just to explain who we are, why we're, you know what we do, not how we do it because that's secret, but you know why we're why we exist. And I, I they would always say, okay, you go and talk about Islamist extremism, and people got very very upset. They said, well, why are you calling it Islamist extremism? I said, because the terrorists are using Islamist beliefs. They are using the Quran. They are using the Hadith, the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, to justify what they're doing. I'm not saying it's, it's normative. I'm not saying it's, it's accepted mainstream version. But for you to tell me that religion has no role in this, I, say, I, I give them a very simple test. Go out and listen to any single broadcast by Al-Qaeda, Islamic State, Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, whatever. You won't get two lines into a propaganda video without a recitation of the Quran or a reference to Muhammad. So they see that as a religious justification for what they're doing. Again, I'm not saying all Islam stands for terrorism. I'm just saying that to say that these guys don't use religion is false. In the same way that Hindu extremists in India use Hindu religion. And Buddhist extremists in Thailand and Sri Lanka and Myanmar use Buddhist teachings to justify, and Christian extremists use Christian teachings to justify violence, and Jewish right. extremists use Jewish teachings to justify violence against the Palestinians in the West Bank. It, again, I'm, I'm not equating religion with violence. I'm just saying that people can use religion to justify violence. Well, I mean, I'm not going to get um, the way that we say it. I'm, I'm not going to get into that discussion with you because I want to work focus on terrorism and stra <laughs> uh, strategy um, and intelligence. But uh, the way we say it is that, um, you know, Islam is inherently violent. Muslims are better than Islam. Christians mm -hmm. are better than Christianity. Hen Jews are better than Judaism and Hindus are better than Hinduism. Like, so I don't say... I do agree. We we think like people that agree with me that Islam is inherently for violence and terrorism. Well, what well, the modern what mo now we call terrorism, uh, but Muslims aren't. Um, and you know, just like Christianity, just like the Bible is definitely for uh, is anti-woman. The Bible yep. does teach you mm -hmm. that women should be silent and have no position of authority. Yet mm -hmm. most Christians disagree with that position. So exactly, and any religion has been used in the past. You know what? If you went to battle against somebody who was from a different faith and your side won the battle, what was the first thing you did? You thank God for being on your side. God led you to victory. God was the one who enabled you to, to, to you know, um, be victorious against your enemy who didn't believe in the same God. I mean, every religion has done that. You, you go to the Old Testament, my God, every second verse in the Old Testament is the Israelites fighting somebody and defeating them because God was on their side. The same thing in the Quran. The Muslims prevailed because Allah was on their side. I mean, the Hindus prevailed because the god Ram was on their side. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Every religion has a heck of a lot of violence in it. But that is, and I, I like the way you put it. I, I mean, that every person who happens to own that faith does not represent the violent past of that faith. And every religion has good and every religion has bad. And I think, you know, uh, okay. many great, many great things have been done in the name of religion and many terrible things have been done in the name of religion. We, I wish we had more of the former and less of the latter.
Well, when 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 Muslims and Christians and Jews do good thing, I don't give the credit to the religion. I give the credit to them, to the individuals. Okay. Um, they, they, there's a quote. I forget. I think it's Weinstein who said that. It says, "Good people do good thing. Good people do good thing, uh, and evil people do evil things, with or without religion." I know it's not exactly how he said it, uh, but for good people to do evil things, that takes religion. That's what Very I think. Interesting. I haven't heard that quote before. Interesting. Yeah. So it's what what you said is also very interesting when it comes to giving credit to religion when because of their victories. It's actually I see a I see a difference between the Sunni uh, way of looking at this and the Shia way of looking at this, and I wonder if you agree because um, Sunnis um, what you know at that time they weren't called Sunni as Shia, but mm-hmm. um, right after the alleged death of Muhammad, um, the Sunnis managed to. You know, build an empire much faster than they could have ever even predicted themselves, and they yeah. shocked the entire world. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Shias um, grew with a history of being oppressed, uh, of being wronged, and it's very interesting because it seemed like it was baked into their ideology that for the Sunnis that you know whose uh, whose side God is on based on who's victorious and who's vin- winning and who's dominating. And at the same time, it was baked into the Shia ideology that you know whose side God is on based on who's being oppressed and who's being wrong and who is, you know. Um, but um, but then this, everything changed um, based on two events after World War One. The Sunnis lost their last Khalifa. Yep. Uh, and based after, after uh, the Islamic Revolution of 1979 in Iran, Shias managed to not just be in power, but use Shiism. I mean, even mm-hmm. the Safavid dynasty, the Shia, mm-hmm. the mullahs were taking a back seat. Yeah, the king and you had like, mm-hmm. they were ruling, but they weren't like in power themselves. But then after you had the Islamic revolution, it was the mullahs actually taking the position of the king. Yeah. So yeah. that both of that went against, so the Sunnis had to respond to that by saying like, well, how does, how do we make sense of this? Uh, we're not like is God not on our side anymore? And the Shias also had to make sense of this. But like, how could we rule? Aren't we supposed to wait for the Mahdi come back to come yeah, back? Yeah, yeah. To rule? and they all they had to make tweaks in their ideologies, which is mm. um, yeah. You, you, it's interesting you say that. So you're right. I mean, the Shias have been the oppressed for uh, millennia, right, or 1400 years. Every single Imam was assassinated by or killed by a so-called Sunni. And of course, you have the you know the, the 12th Imam who goes into hiding. And then he's still in hiding like a thousand years later. He's got a really good hiding spot, obviously, because no one's found him yet. Um, <laughs> but the other thing you have to, you know, don't forget, I mean, is that in 1979, you have the revolution in February. You also have a very, very important two events in later on 79. In November, you have the Grand Mosque is invaded by yes. Sunni extremists, right? By a so-called Mahdi, a so-called, you know, great person descending to restore the, the glory of Islam. And then, of course, you have the, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan on, on, right. on Christmas Day, which eventually leads to the creation of Al-Qaeda as a terrorist group to fight against the Soviet invasion because you always have people rising up to evict the occupier. That's just a standard thing in world history. And, of course, eventually you have you know, 9-11 and the rise of what we now call Sunniism as extremism. But I think you're right. I, I, and, and I certainly know that within Shia, especially Iranian Shia Islam, you do have a cult of martyrdom which goes back again to all the imams being having been killed in Hussein. gruesome ways sometimes. And then you see Yahu Hussein, Yahu Hussein, Yahu, people going through the streets and they cut themselves, the, the, you know, the, the, um, the Arba'in, all the kinds of festivals that people engage in where they're, they're publicly display, I'm ready to die for my faith. I'm ready to, to lose my life to, to advance my cause kind of thing. So I, I do think it's interesting that you know, the martyrdom complex, which is something that we normally associate with Sunni Islamist extremists, because they're, they're, all the suicide bombers are mostly Sunnis, and yet the martyrdom complex is a very, very strong historical pull uh, within the Shia part of the faith because of the fact that they were the underdogs for the better part of 1400 years. Yeah, actually, we grew up with the story of Hussein Fahmideh in elementary yeah. school, which was the, the kid that uh, had you know bombs on himself and went under yes. an Iraqi tank. And yes. he's, he's even on, on the money in Iran. So uh, and he celebrated as a hero, even though he was like a kid when he did that. So we grew up with that story. Um, and well, yeah, the, you know, the, the, the mullahs yeah. were really bad at convincing kids to go, you know, as suicide bombers against Saddam Hussein's army in, in, in the war that lasted in what September 1980 to 1989, just as, as Khomeini died. And you know, I remember reading stories that 
the kids would they'd have these little plastic keys put around yes. their necks. And these were the keys to open the door, the gates of paradise when they died in the martyrdom. And these kids were just kids. Like these were really young kids who didn't know what they were doing. They were convinced by the mullahs or by whomever that they, they that they should help Iranian great Iranian society by dying for it. And you know these poor kids were exploited in the same way that groups like Boko Haram in Nigeria sent six year old girls strapped with suicide bombs into villages to blow up people. Right? It's the kids that suffer. They they don't understand what they're going for. They they just they're told they 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 do what they're told. We had mothers sending their kids to war, hoping that the kids would die so that they could be martyrs. Um, well, and something I, they got money for it too, right? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, the Palestinians do that. The Palestinians would pay out families of of uh, suicide bombers. There would just right. be a cash I, a I, cash reward. I mean, I do genuinely think that it must be mostly the ideology that I mean, no amount of money can convince a mother, I think, to send their child to die. I think it must be the fact that they think their child is going to be a bit in a better place, Maybe. Um, yeah. to that, and this is the best thing for their children that might convince them to send their kids to die to war. Well, and, and I'd be curious. I mean, if you looked at the study of the kids that actually died as suicide bombers in the Iran-Iraq War, how many came from the wealthier uh, suburbs of Tehran, and how many came from the poorer areas of Tehran? I bet a lot more were poorer than richer. I imagine the rich Iranians are saying, "Screw that! I'm not sending my kid to do that." Whereas some, you know, mother in a in a in a, in a slum in Tehran right. would actually say, "Well, this is my as you said, my, maybe my child's off to a better place than what we have right, right, right now." Yeah, I mean, if if you if your life is good, you might be more invested in this world rather than the next exactly. one. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. And I I also remember in school we, we had teachers who, when they were telling their stories of their experience in the Iran Iraq War because a lot of the people the boomer generation were actually participating like went uh, volunteered as soldiers right and yes. I remember a lot of times when they would tell us their stories they would cry about, and say that they their greatest regret in life is that they didn't die yeah. and become a martyr like this is grown men in our classroom crying that is telling yeah. us how sad they are that they survived I guess it goes to show, I mean, you know, we used to call those people brainwashed. I don't think the term brainwashing is used anymore, but it certainly goes to show how convinced and dedicated someone can get to a cause, so much so that they will actually sacrifice their own life and feel like um, less than perfect if they don't achieve that. So I'm not actually surprised by that. I mean, you know, ideology, whether it's a religious ideology or political ideology or what I used to do with terrorist ideology, can be a very, very strong part of your life. You almost kind of give yourself up to it and you want to do anything you can to be accepted as a member in that group. And therefore, you'll be you'll listen to the, to the words of others. You know, one thing that I worked on a lot was, you know, how is it that people become radicalized? How do they actually adopt the ideology? And we found one thing which was very, very important and, and, and people keep making this mistake to this day people talk about self-radicalization that's a complete myth nobody self-radicalizes you always learn it from somebody else whether it's your father or your friend or your imam or your mullah or, or your teachers or whatever some guy you found on the internet nobody has the ability to to go from zero to 100 by themselves they need help they need inspiration they need guidance they need a little bit of pushing they need coercion sometimes so the ideology can fill that bill. And for some people, they can go the entire distance and actually embrace an ideology and be willing to die for it. I mean, I guess you're right, because n none of our ideas are built in a vacuum. Like even no. non-radicalized, every single idea I have is influenced by the books I read, the po YouTube videos I watch, the podcasts I listen to. So how could, how would radicalization be any different? So yeah, you're absolutely exactly. right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, um, so it's interesting um, that you mentioned the 1979 events, uh, because... Um, I heard somewhere you mentioned that this. Uh, you mentioned right now also that the Sunni uh, terrorists. Most of the terrorist attacks are by Sunnis. Uh, I wonder if that's only when we focus on attacks on Westerners, mm. because maybe I think like if we just. I think a lot of times people start this like right, right now. For example, people forget about terrorism when Western so-called Western countries are not the yeah. target, even though. Yeah. As we speak, terrorism is still going on on yeah. a massive scale in a lot of places. It just seems like people just don't care anymore. And I think like well, if we do include all uh, not attacks on Westerners, uh, it seems like the Shias are a major contributor to, to terrorism as well. 
Okay, you, you've raised some really good points, and, and this gets really complicated because first and foremost, uh, we have to agree on what is terrorism. What does terrorism mean? And there's a, there's at least 200 definitions out there, and you can use whatever definition you want to fit the data that you have. So it, it, it's not easy to pin down what terrorism means. What I use, because there's two things that I use. First of all, I use the Canadian Criminal Code because I'm Canadian. And it says that terrorism is a serious act of violence planned or perpetrated for a religious, political, or ideological reason. It doesn't say who you are. You can be a state, non-state, individual group. doesn't matter. That, that, that's not the part that's not important. It's the reason why you do it. Secondly, um, there's an interesting document called the Global Terrorism Index. It's an annual report put out by an Australian-based um, think tank called the Institute for Economics and Peace. And if you look at their 2018 edition, which is the latest one, there are about 16,000 deaths from terrorism in 2018, according to their criteria, which again, it, it depends. We all use different criteria. Out of those 16,000 deaths, 75% occurred in Afghanistan, um, Nigeria, Somalia, Iraq, and Syria. 99% of those deaths were carried out by Sunni Islamist extremists. Al-Qaeda, Al Islamic State, Boko Haram, right. Al-Shabaab, the Taliban, Islamic State, Khorasan, you name it kind of thing. So it, so depending on how on what you're trying to measure, it's still true that in 2020, the vast majority of attacks are carried out. So religiously motivated attacks are carried out by Sunni Islamist extremists. Now, do the Shia carry out attacks? Absolutely. And it's not so much that, that, that there are attacks that are not in the West, because this report looks at the entire globe. It's not just the West we're worried about. A lot of, I think, what, you're, what we would call attacks could also be interpreted as like acts of war. And this is where it gets really, really difficult, right? Because when you try to dis differentiate what is an act of war versus what is a terrorist, you also get caught up in Ronald Reagan's famous line from the 1980s, one man's terrorist, another man's freedom fighter. You know, terrorism is in the eye of the beholder. I, I, I was talking to an American the other day, and I said, for the British, the American patriots in 1776 were terrorists because they tried to overthrow the regime using violence. To the Americans, they were freedom fighters and they're patriots and they're heroes. So perspective means everything in, in this regard. I still maintain that in 2020, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, like I was an Iranian analyst for 20 years. I, I, I get, I understand Iran, probably more than the average, you know, non, non farsi speaking, oh, non-Iranian. Yeah, non sure. um, no, more I than, don't... okay, no, more than Iranian as well. <laughs> well. That's very flattering, thank you. Um, I still maintain that I worry a lot more about Sunni Islamist extremists than I do about Shia Islamist terrorism. I do worry about Iran to a great extent because of, in fact, the regime for the past 41 years and counting has been run by a theocracy. Uh, it is not a democracy, despite the fact they claim it is. And, and that theocracy does want to sort of regain, you know, the glory days of Shia Islam, which actually occurred uh, never. <laughs> there never were no glory days of Shia Islam. If you think about it, they've always been the underdog, which I think explains a lot of sort of Iranian foreign policy. So I do think Iran really meddles, obviously, in Lebanon and Iraq and Syria and uh, other countries as well. But when it comes to terrorism, very narrowly defined, I still think that statistics will back me up that the vast majority of attacks today are still carried out by Sunni Islamist extremists. Now, will that change? It could. And one thing we learn when you work in intelligence is never assume that what happens today is going to happen tomorrow because events change, uh, movements change, uh, you know, a whole bunch of things can be altered so that something else happens. Let me give you a very simple example. Uh, I worked in intelligence when we won the Cold War. I remember. I remember when the Soviet Union fell. I remember when the Berlin Berlin Wall fell. We, we celebrated. We, yeah, we won. We won the war. Everything was over. So I guess we don't have to worry about Russia anymore, right? Who cares about Russia? <laughs> uh, that was what uh, thirty years ago. Right. Who cares about Russia now? <laughs> A lot of people care about Russia now, right? So things change, and uh, you know, no one no one cared about terrorism when the wall fell. Terrorism was a non-entity. Nobody was looking at it. There were no scholars, or very few scholars. Certainly, the intelligence community wasn't looking at it. It wasn't a major thing we worried about. In fact, we, we even told ourselves after the wall fell, maybe we're out of a job. There's nothing left for us to do. For, I mean, Francis Fukuyama famously said it was the end of history, right? Wow. And that, and you know, there's nothing else interesting happening. Of course, he was wrong, and he's admitted that he was wrong. But my point is, is that things can change, but the status quo still for me, and, and I still read two, three hours a day about what's happening in the world. And every day when I'm out tweeting and, all, and blogging, 99.9% of the attacks are carried out by Sunni Islamist extremists. So two, two points to that. Um, I guess it's, yeah, you're, I mean, if you just measure it in terrorism, 
um, the, we get what you said, but if we just measure it in causing problems in general, not just terrorism, um, I mean, even for some people, I mean, um, some people say like, it doesn't matter if it's a state, just like you mentioned, it's how you categorize it. Is uh, mm-hmm. The Islamic Republic of Iran is a terrorist state. And if you consider that a terrorist state, then there is no other terrorist group which is as organized and as well funded um, mm-hmm. as, the, as the Islamic Republic of Iran. That's one. Uh, but even if you don't um, consider a terrorism because it's a state, they are still causing the most amount of pro- problems in the region. I mean, yes, if you look at the Sunni countries, um, Sunni regimes, they're not necessarily you know, funding terrorism themselves there's terrorism grows inside them but it's and they they also don't have this imperialist attitude they're just mostly trying to defend their borders versus Mm -hmm. but iran is actually trying to bring back the persian empire and is meddling in iraq and syria and lebanon and yemen um, and everybody else is playing a defense game so that what makes iran a more hostile force in the region than anyone else and another thing that people say that all of all of this terrorism uh, is a reaction. Like this is why I was mentioning the 1979 revolution. Right. It right. was a reaction to Iran's um, meddling after, because right after the 1979 revolution and Iran building proxies around the region, it was Saudi Arabia's response to Iran's proxy building that made them start, you know, spreading, exporting Wahhabism around the region mm-hmm. as far as Pakistan and now as far as Indonesia and that's right. Wahhabism that was response to Iran was the source of all this terrorism so that's uh, I w- okay I, I wouldn't go there I think that the Saudis have their own interests I think the Saudis have their own program I'm glad you mentioned about the spread of Wahhabism the spread of Wahhabism coincides with the, with the increase in the price of oil in the 1970s 1973 um, oil crisis the Saudis all of a sudden found themselves flushed with cash Wahhabi Islam dates back to the middle of the 18th century, 1744 actually, is the sort of the, the year when they, the, the, of the Wahhab uh, got in bed with the Al Saud clan and they came up with an agreement. The Al Sauds would run the country uh, politically and the uh, Al Wahhab would run the country religiously. And they, you know, they, they really frightened the Ottoman Empire so much so that in, I was at 1810, the, they sent an army down to what was then Arabia before it became Saudi Arabia and, and, and kicked the crap out of, out of the Wahhabis because they were really afraid. And then, of course, you know, beginning of the 19, in the 1920s, you had the, the Ikhwan in the, in, that took over basically all of Saudi Arabia. And, and so you've had a Wahhabi state since the 1920s. So, and the only reason that the, it took them until the 1970s to spread their hateful, intolerant, very, to me, disgusting interpretation of Islam worldwide because they finally had money. They were flushed with cash because of the oil crisis. And this is why you have Indonesia today really worried about what? Wahhabi teachings. I mean, Indonesia has got to be the most chill Islamic country on the planet, right? Used to be. The, used, used to be. But why are they not now? Because they've had a lot of influence from Wahhabi clerics. And so I think that the two, I'm not saying that that, that, that wasn't partly a reaction to the Iranian revolution, but first of all, A, it predates it. And secondly, I do think the Saudis have their own agenda. I think they're trying to do things because they do believe that their particular austere interpretation of Islam is superior to that, not just the Shias, but even other forms. I mean, the, the Wahhabis hate the Sufi, for God's sakes. They hate anybody that doesn't think the, way, the same way that they do. I mean, that's what the House of Wahhab thinks. The House of Saud sees all of this Wahhabism as an inconvenience that they have to deal with. I well, mean, the House, of Saud, they, the House of Saud mostly worships money than anything else. No, they do. They do. But like I said, that you know, this this bargain between the Sauds and the, and the Wahhabs dates back to 1744. I mean, you know, you could say that, that currently uh, MBS is is a reformer. I've got different views on that, by the way. Uh, I don't I don't yeah, like I don't MBS. See. Oh, well, uh, I, I, I you know, called him out from the as as from the very beginning as a yeah as a problem. He's an auto, he, he's an autocrat. He's and he's he's a very nasty man, uh, not just because of what he did to Khashoggi, but other things as well. But I, I do think there is this struggle for the soul of Islam, and it, I, I think it's portrayed as the Saudis on the one side, and they'll be the champions for Sunni Islam, and the Iranians will be the champions for Shia Islam. And there's no question that they're clashing in Yemen, uh, they're clashing in Syria, they're clashing in Iraq, uh, and I think that. You know, part of that is the fact that neither of them wants the other side to win. Uh, the Iranians want to regain the greatness of the, of the of the Persian Empire. The Saudis see themselves as as the you know the keeper of the Hadamain, right? The two holy sites. Right. And therefore, they should they should dictate who rules the roost when it comes to Islam. So you've got two significant powers, both of whom think they're right, 
and both of them would like to kick the snot out of the other one because they don't like to share that kind of uh, right. mantle of Islam. But the thing is, though, from the very first, from the very beginning, the marriage, the both both the literal and the figurative ma- uh, marriage between the House of Saud and House of Wahhab was House of Saud looking at Islam as a tool, but House of yes. Wahhab looking at Islam as a goal. And yeah. I think it never changed like that. That whole idea never changed. The reason, but by the way, the reason why I think like Wahhab, the growth of Wahhabism is a response to Iran. You mentioned the oil prices going up in 1973, Free. right? Yep. Uh, but it, but Wahhabism was not a force. I mean, yes, it pre predates that by a lot, but it wasn't. It was mostly a Saudi thing until mm-hmm. 1979. The, the exporting that ideology. Um, to around the planet only started after 1979. It does, but don't confuse correlation with causation, right? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not doubting that what you're saying is partially true in the sense that the Saudis saw an opportunity because maybe they feared the spread of Shia Islam mm-hmm. led by the Iranians, and therefore they thought they had to preempt that. But in all honesty, was there any real any real danger of the Iranians exporting Shia theocracy to Indonesia? Was there any real danger of exporting Shia theocracy to North America, which the Saudis have done as well? I've been to mosques in Canada. I've I've seen the Wahhabi Qurans in the mosques in Canada. So it, right. I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm not trying to underestimate that Iran, as I say, is a nasty actor, and one we have to worry about. But maybe this was a bit of an overreaction. But if this is true, a bit of an overreaction by the Saudis, who just wanted to stop any possibility that Iran would gain the upper hand. Well, I mean, for, I think for uh, it growing to Indonesia and United States, that wasn't the Saudi plan. Um, that just Wahhabism is just, um, I think, it just um, grew out of their hand. Like I think the Iran managed to have a, a much tighter leash on their proxies, and mm-hmm. uh, like the the proxies um, of Iranian regime uh, is filled with people who would uh, who with non Iranians who give their lives for Khamenei, mm-hmm. but the Wahhabism, the the ISIS and Al Qaeda who grew, they would actually now behead the Saudi <laughs> monarchs themselves. No, I know. Could. No, you, you, you know, you you raise a really good point. I mean, I, I think what's happened is the Saudis have kind of lost control of the game here, right? right? They thought they had this deal with the Wahhabis, and, and now they know that they're actually the enemy. In fact, Bin Laden said that, right? Bin Laden said that back in early 1991, when the Saudis asked the Americans to come in. So when, when, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, I remember I was working intelligence at the time, um, the, the Saudis were scared. They were scared out of their wits, because the Saudis could, couldn't fight a battle if you paid them. They're, they're hopeless. They're useless. So they called the Americans in to protect us. And Bin Laden said to the, to the Saudi king, don't call in the Americans. We'll do it for you. We'll, we'll, we'll protect you against Saddam Hussein because we hate them as well. And then when, the, when, they, when they called the Americans in, said, uh, Bin Laden said, okay, that's it. You're no longer my friend. You're no longer my enemy. And this is why you had the bombings in 96 in Hobart. And then you had, of course, 9-11 and everything else. So it, it, was, it was a miscalculation by the Saudis at the time. But, and, you know, it, it wasn't hard to understand. The Saudi-U.S. relationship has been very, 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 very strong since the 1930s. It was, I mean, it was American technology that exploited their Saudi oil. It was the you know the American deal between Roosevelt and and uh, Al Saud and the what uh, Great Bitter Lake whatever 1940 whatever the hell year it was where they agreed to become partners kind of thing. So but you know they in some ways they miscalculated and and as a result they they are now seen as part of the problem. This is why you've had the terrorist attacks in Riyadh and El Khobar and a, a variety of other places over the past 25 years. I mean uh, that's a very good point, a very interesting point because. I mean, I can't imagine what the ben, uh, ben Laden and his people were thinking when this happened, because they went all the way to Afghanistan because they could not accept infidels on Muslim land. That was the entire point of fighting the Russians. But now, they're, while they're there, back at home, yeah. Saudi Arabia, Saudi's government is inviting infidels yeah, not on exactly. a Muslim land, they're inviting them on the Muslim land, I on know, a place where Muhammad himself promised that exactly. infidels will never step foot on. Exactly. <laughs> and so Al-Qaeda said, look, at, we, we defeated the Soviets. We defeated the second greatest army on earth. Right. In, in, in 10 years. You don't think we could defeat Saddam Hussein? This is like, this is chicken feed. This is like could an they, afternoon. Could they, have, could they have? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, Al-Qaeda is never an army, right? But they certainly, through, I mean, it took them 10 years before the Soviets left, finally left Afghanistan in 1989. It was, it was a very slow, bit by bit, suicide bomb here, attack here, IED here, armed assault here. I mean, who knows? I mean, and who knows if, if Saddam Hussein ever really intended to invade Saudi Arabia anyway? I think the Saudis panicked 
because he took over Kuwait in what, like nine and a half minutes, I think it took for him to invade Kuwait. And the Saudis wondered, because their military was so useless, that if he decided to invade Saudi Arabia, and of course, you know, why did Saddam Hussein invade Kuwait? He claimed it was the lost 19th province of Iraq, that it, when Kuwait became independent in 1960, Saddam Hussein claimed that was our land. You know, the British created a separate country out of Iraqi territory. That was always Iraqi territory. We're going to take it back by force. Right. And the Kuwaitis were about as good at self-defense as the Saudis were, i.e. not good at all. This is why they had no defense. So I think the Saudis panicked. I think they thought that if Saddam Hussein did turn his eye to Saudi Arabia, I don't think he had any. Well, actually, there is that territory, that disputed territory for the longest time between Iraq and Saudi Arabia in the north. It's, I don't know if it's still there. But, you know, Saddam, Saddam Hussein was a brutal, brutal man, dictator. He could justify doing whatever he wanted. So if he decided that Saudi Arabia was next on the list, he, he would roll through Saudi Arabia as well. Hence why the Saudis called in for the support of the Americans. Why do Saudis suck at warfare so much? I mean, like, even even to this day, with all the, like, they did the world's largest weapons deal yeah. history has ever seen, yeah. Yeah. and they can't even defeat the Yemenis. I know. Uh, um, it's, it's, yeah. it's because they're rich, fat, oil oil bureaucrats. <laughs> I, mean, right. I mean, no, it's true. I've, I've been to Saudi Arabia many times. I mean, and I, I do it from Saudi friends, but, I mean, I'm, this is not a stereotype. Many Saudis do not work. You know, the, the welfare state has been very strong since the 1970s. And people go to jobs where they don't do anything all day and they're paid. They're just not used to uh, to working. They're not used to fighting. They're not used to defending themselves. And they know that at the end of the day, the Americans will come over the hill. Because the Americans have told them, we are your protector. We cannot afford for your oil fields to not go, go into production. Despite the fact that the United States is by far the world's greatest producer of oil right now. There's still that pact that was signed by Roosevelt and, and the king back in the 1940s that says we will have your back whenever you need us. That's why they're so terrified right now, because as as United States makes us more oil and as oil pr demand mm -hmm. goes lower and lower, Saudi Arabia is worried about how well, they're, reliable they're, 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 they're screwed. They're screwed. Right. Yeah. Without oil, Saudi Arabia is done. This is why MBS is trying to make this new technology park, this new That's city in the desert kind of thing. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. There's no culture of, of doing that in the country. And again, I'm not dismissing every, I mean, there, there's some great Saudi citizens, probably very oh, yeah. entrepreneurial, all that kind of stuff. But the, the country doesn't have that culture of working your way up, you know, as entrepreneurs starting business because oil has been always there. And, you know, the, Saud the Saudis can pump it out for what, like a dollar a barrel and sell it for at its height, $120 a barrel. Like all the money coming in. And, it, and, there's, and, and let's, let's face it, how many people in the oil, in the Saudi oil sector are Saudis? Historically, very few. Mm. They are all Americans. No, there's this probably is, more Saudis right now, but historically, there are very few of them. This is why Saudi Arabia is, uh, is sending a letter to China saying, like, what you're doing with Muslims there is is a okay, and we congratulate you with okay. your anti-terrorism, because they're desperate for more superpowers to be allies with them. I mean, the the where you know the people that they're supposed to be the guardian of the ho two holy cities are now defending the worst human rights atrocity yeah. like on the, on the planet against Muslims. Like this is it's unbelievable. Like I thought that they're such big hypocrites that they wouldn't say anything against China, yeah. uh, but to actually send a congratulation letter to China, I that I didn't even see. That was like unbelievable. I, I'm glad you raised the whole Xinjiang uh, situation because I talked about that in my second book, I think. Um, yeah, what China is doing to the Xinjiang Uyghur Muslims is genocide. And the fact that so many other Muslim nations are not doing anything about it is because they're afraid of China. They need Chinese money, they need Chinese investment. You know, the One Belt, One Road initiative, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're afraid that under Trump, the Americans are going to go home and look at their own now. So they need allies. But yeah, for the Saudis and, and many other uh, Muslim nations to not call out Pakistan. China, what it, for, to not call out China, what it's doing to the Uyghurs is criminal. It's Absolutely criminal. criminal. It's very yeah. interesting because we... Um, we call, we consider ourselves anti-Islam activists, but we also consider ourselves pro-human rights and right. to defend Muslims, even though we're against yeah. Islam. We try to def yeah. and we're I think like on a per capita basis, we are uh, us anti-Islam people are calling out the atheist regime of China more than yeah. a lot of Muslims are. Like a lot, there's a lot of silence. I mean, at least give credit. We give credit to Turkey for. I don't know if we should give them credit because it seems like strategic, but it seems like Turkey is the only country that is calling it out. Like, I don't yeah. understand. Even Iran is not calling it out. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it, it's sad. It's very sad that this is happening because, you know, these poor people, um, 
Now, see, here's the problem with the Uyghurs. Yes, there are Uyghur terrorists. And in fact, there are a lot of Uyghurs that fought for Islamic State. They're, they're amongst one of the greatest per capita contributions to the foreign fighters for Islamic State in the 2010s. And there have been dozens of terrorist attacks in China carried out by Uyghur Islamist extremists. But the response of the government is a million times disproportionate to the actual threat. And so, you know, they created the concentration camps, which they call training centers. Uh, they've, they've destroyed hundreds, if not thousands, of mosques in the region. Uh, they're forcing people to stop wearing certain clothing. I mean, it, it's just separating but families. Yeah, separating. but they see, but see, that's what that's what that's what autocratic regimes do, right? Because a they get, because the a they can they can get away with it, and b they know if that if they're powerful enough, no one's going to say anything. And it's exactly what you said. I mean, a lot of people aren't saying anything against them, so they keep doing it. And, and who's going to stop them? And isn't this a recipe to actually create more radical terrorists? It, it is absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And I, I don't even, I mean, the Chinese are not dumb. I don't I don't think they actually mind, like, they must know that this is going to cause more terrorism, but maybe they don't mind more terrorism because they want, might justify what they're doing. I don't know. It's, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the regime of Xi Jinping, if you understand it, I'd, I'd like you to explain it to me, please. I mean, you know, the actions of the Chinese government over the past couple of years have been very, very um, hard. I mean, look, look, at you and I are both Canadians. Look, look they just they just charged... Michael um, uh, Spavor and, and the other Michaels with, with, with espionage. They're going to get convicted of espionage, despite the fact they're just two guys that were caught up in the whole um, Huawei affair here in Vancouver. Mm. You know, trying to predict what China does and why it does it is uh, is a very difficult. And I'm not I'm not a China specialist, so I won't go down that road. Right. But you know, there are a lot of things that China does that I think we all could agree are you know what they're doing in Hong Kong, what they're doing in the South China Sea, the so-called Nine Dash Line south in the South China Sea. There are a lot of things that China is behind that certainly we, we should be protesting about more in the West. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you're just being humble saying you're not, I mean, but it doesn't take a specialist to be able to call this out as a human rights, as, a, as the greatest Absolutely. human rights violation of our time. I mean, I don't Absolutely. know. Yeah. I mean, what, what do you what do you what will you say right now is the worst things happening? Because I think a lot of people are, have stopped paying attention because it's not back. Oh, it's not not in my backyard. So they stop caring. But I mean, I think that what China is doing and what Saudi Arabia and Iran and the United States and some European countries are doing into Yemen, um, that's that's high on the list. Um, Libya, North Korea, Libya, Libya. Oh, yeah. Libya. Libya is just so complicated and yeah. so many external factors right now exactly. uh, involved that people can't even start, comprehend what's happening there. Uh, it seems like do you think like that uh, there's going to be a major conflict between Turkey and Egypt because of Libya? Like I don't know. It's, it's hard. It's hard to say. Um, the way I look at Libya is, you know, everyone hated Gaddafi for years, and, and rightly so. He was a dictator. He was a sponsor of terror, uh, all that kind of stuff. So we finally got rid of him. And what did we get? What did we get in return? We get chaos. complete chaos. We got a civil war, as you said. Turkey is supporting the General National Accord government. You have. The Emiratis, the Egyptians supporting the, uh, General Haftar. You have Russian mercenaries in the region now. You have the European Union on one side. You have the Italians on the other side. I mean, it's just a complete, it's a complete mess right now. And yeah. I'm not saying that I, I wish that Gaddafi was still around, but boy, a bunch of Libyans are probably saying things weren't that bad under Gaddafi compared to where they are right now. The other crisis that that we, everyone's forgetting about is what's happening in Myanmar with the Rohingya. Oh yeah, there's over, there's over a million Muslims that are that are living in squalid. Uh, refugee camps in, in Bangladesh and near Cox's Bazaar because the Myanmar army, the Myanmar government does not consider the Rohingya to be Myanmar. They said that they are immigrants, that they are interlopers and they don't belong. They're, they're, you know, Myanmar recognizes 56 ethnic groups and the Rohingya are not amongst those 56, which justifies the military campaign of raising villages, burning them to the ground, raping women, killing men, you know, killing babies. And a million Rohingya had to flee for their lives over the past couple of years. And everyone's forgot about that crisis right now too. It's not showing any signs of getting resolved. I mean, so and, given and, what given what you're mentioning and all these atrocities that is happening, um, how what are your views on the level of intervention and in that um, you know European and North American c uh, countries uh, need to have or not have, or based on their record, was it good? Was it bad? Was it a mix? <laughs> How much, how much time do we have? Um, <laughs> the, the problem is, is that you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. So let, let's, let's just use 9-11 as an example. In the days after 9-11, 3,000 people dead, you know, in New York and Washington. 
no president, prime minister, king, dictator, whatever, would have had the choice of doing nothing. You can't sit back and watch 3,000 of your citizens die without getting some kind of revenge, retribution, justice, call it what you want. So when President Bush decided to go into Afghanistan shortly after, he, that was the only choice he had. There, there was no second option, mm -hmm. right? So they went to Afghanistan, they tried to find Al-Qaeda, they tried to find bin Laden, they bombed the caves in Tora Bora. Bin Laden did, wasn't killed for almost 10 years. He was killed in May of 2011, and he was found in a compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan, not in Afghanistan. The problem is, is that by go the Americans had no choice to go in, and th their goal was A, to, to find Al-Qaeda, B, to prevent Al-Qaeda from carrying out an attack like that ever again, and C, if they're lucky to help build a representative government in Afghanistan so that the Taliban couldn't gain power and serve as a host for Al-Qaeda or whatever in the future. Um, Al-Qaeda is still around, so that goal wasn't accomplished. They did get bin Laden, but it took them 10 years. And the third goal, I don't know how, how much you follow Afghanistan. I follow it daily. Uh, there are terrorist attacks on a daily basis in Afghanistan. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so the, Bush, uh, the Trump administration is in peace talks with the Taliban mm. to, to form a government because the Taliban refuses to recognize the, the, the government in Afghanistan. And they've said quite categorically, if, if the U.S. leaves, we're going to recreate the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. So and they can. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye human rights, goodbye rights for women, good, goodbye rights for, for non-Muslims, et cetera, et cetera. So the answer to your question is a complicated one. Sometimes by going in and taking action, we can achieve some good. But the problem is the longer you stay, you overstay your welcome. And that has happened with every single occupation in history. People don't want you sticking around. If you want to come in and help, come in and help, then get the hell out. Don't stick around because when you stick around, bad things happen. So look at the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Everyone agreed that Saddam Hussein was a miserable son of a bitch and we're glad he's dead. But is Iraq any better off now, 18 years later, than it was in 2003? I don't know if I would say the answer to that question is yes. And, you know, the longer the Americans stayed, you know, you have mistakes happen. Mistakes. Drone strikes that, that kill innocent civilians. Um, an American convoy that feels threatened and starts opening fire on women and children. Those just things are natural things that happen because of occupations. You basically, you know, you're there too long and that people want you to get out. And, and if you don't get out willingly, then you get sort of guerrilla campaigns and you get freedom fighter campaigns and you get terrorist campaigns. People saying, we don't want you here. You have to leave and we'll force you to leave if we, if we have to. So I, I guess it's a long answer to a very short question. I don't know. I don't know what the best intervention is. Is it, is it strictly humanitarian? Then you have to get the acceptance and agreement of the local people to do that. And I can tell you right now, Myanmar is not going to accept any international aid into its own country to help the, the Rohingya go back to their villages. As far as Myanmar is concerned, they're not really part of our country. They're not citizens. Good riddance to bad rubbish. You can live in Bangladesh because they claim they're all Bangladeshis ethnically. Go live in Bangladesh, which is your real country, not ours. So do you, you know, can you imagine sending the military into Myanmar to, to resolve this? That would be a disaster. So if you're talking intervention, what kind of intervention would you advocate and for how long? And what, are the, what, what is your plan? What is your plan for day one? And what is your plan for day 100 and day 300 and day 1,000? That's where it gets complicated. So, um, I mean, you, you, when you say damn if you do, damn if you don't, again, when you leave Iraq, we, they did leave Iraq and then ISIS grew. Um, out of that, so then they like, okay, we have to go back in again. Yep. So yep. I mean, you, we say terrorist group grows when you're there because people are upset that mm -hmm. you're here, but then they also grow when you leave because you're not yeah. there to fight them. Yeah. So, but then people say it's not our problem. Why? Why do we have to deal with it? But and then when you wash, uh, when you don't deal with it, and you're like, okay, let's wash our hands off of it. We're not going to deal with it. Yeah. Then the human, yeah. uh, then the human rights violations happen, and people say, yeah. like, what happened to never forget? What happened to the? Why yeah. is the world sitting by and letting this happen? Yeah. So I don't. Know. <laughs> it's, it's no, those are those are all very valid points, and we live in an era where the pictures are are on our our laptops instantaneously. We see what's happening within seconds of it happening. I mean, think back, you know, 200 years ago. There were atrocities on a massive scale historically. You never heard about them because there was no New York Times. There was no Al Jazeera. There was no BBC. There was no satellite. There was no internet. People didn't find out about the massacres in Africa and Asia and North America and South America. You just didn't hear about them. Nowadays, we hear about them. And I think our conscience as human beings tells us we cannot stand for that. We can't. Doing nothing is not an option. 
we have to do something. The problem becomes, what is that something going to look like? Is it a military Thanks. occupation? Is it sanctions? Is it humanitarian intervention? Is it, nego is it the UN? Is it, is it negotiations? Is it, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think there's any optimal solution in these, in, these, in these scenarios. And this is why I say you're damned if you do, damned if you don't, because it almost seems like no matter what you do, if you do nothing, people will die. If you do something, people will die. So I guess you made the calculation, uh, where, will, where will fewer people die? When I intervene or when I don't intervene? And of course, none of us has a crystal ball. So how do you make that call? They say there are no solutions, only trade-offs. I think so. Hmm. Yeah, and I think it's because life is complicated. You've got right. multiple actors with multiple agendas. Nothing is perfect in this world. And, I, and I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say this to dismiss or to undermine some very good people who are trying to do very good things. My heart goes out to them. But, you know, I'm, I'm a realist. Like, like I'm, just an old, I'm, just, I'm just an old intelligence guy. I, I, live, I live my life in the real world. Um, I, I saw a lot of things. And, and there's, there's certain things about the human condition and so, certain things about human history that I fear are not going to change anytime soon. So I'm not saying that we, we could ignore this stuff, but we have to accept that bad things are going to happen. And we try to minimize those bad things, but we're not going to eliminate them. And let's not pretend we're going to do that. And, and it sounds very negative. I, to me, it's just, it's just accepting the world for what it is. Right. I mean, uh, th that's very, I mean for example... In Iran, for example, you're very right. Like even for Iran, like when you talk about um, United States intervention in Iran or not, even among Iranian people, it seems to be a major split. Um, and there's no reliable statistics to see exactly what this, where the split is. But a lot of people uh, will welcome, for example, United States coming up and helping them get rid of the regime. And a lot of people, um, another group of people, are like, "No, this is like." Uh, stay out of it this is our revolution let us handle yeah. it uh, yeah. but some other people are like well how's that been working out for you for the past 40 years um yeah. but there are also, i mean and also the regime has its own supporters as well I'm, i mean some people underestimate that a lot of people think like based on the protests that they say in the street that everybody in iran is tired of the government i mean i would think the government has its own at least 10 million supporters out of 80 yes. million yeah Probably. so Probably. so there's that as well but what do you think, like, when it comes, like, let's, if you use Iran as an example, what does help? Like, sanctions, should they top oh, or not, topple the, yeah. topple the government, not topple the government, work with the activists on the ground, or stay out of it? I, I, think, I think that we, we missed a real opportunity um, with the election of, of, of Khatami as president. I thought he was somebody who reached out as a partner, and... And I'm going to say this, and I'm going to be criticized for it. I think the Americans, who are, let's face it, they're the, they're the elephant in the room, right? Whatever the Americans think, it carries a lot of weight. And we all know that. I think the Americans are still living 1979. I still think they're living the embarrassment of the, of the embassy takeover in November of 1979. Hmm. I think they're living the embarrassment of they could, you know, the failed rescue. Remember the rescue attempt in the Saudi desert, the helicopters crashed yep, into yep, other? Yep, yeah, yeah. They called uh, it. Fact, oh, many called it an act of God. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, whatever. Um, it, you know, it took the Algerians to negotiate the release, and and of course the ultimate humiliation was was Jimmy Carter. They they weren't released until Ronald Reagan was sworn as as president. So Carter couldn't even claim to have gotten the Americans out. I think the Americans have um, a disproportionate hate for the Iranian regime, which is a nasty regime, and that when when Hatemi came around, see when Hatemi came around. Bush made his famous Axis of Evil speech, which is one of the stupidest speeches in the history of the planet. Because, first of all, it made no sense. North Korea, Iran, and Iraq were not allies to any real significant extent. There were three random countries that put on a list. And I think the people that in Iran that saw Khatami as something different, and maybe someone who could breach that gap between the West and Iran was finally elected as a president in our country, and we slapped his hand away. And then, of course, the mullahs themselves undermined Khatami when he was president. I get that. I'm not, I'm not trying to dismiss that either. But I do think we missed a, a grand opportunity to make some progress. And in fact, you know, Iran did, did, did extend a hand to the Americans after 9-11, saying we, we can help. Now, so, were, were they also hosting some Al-Qaeda guys? Yeah, probably. But my point is, is that I think that there was a blip in history where there was 
so we're recording again. We just lost connection for a little bit. Now we're back on. So we were talking about Khatami and how United States missed an opportunity. Mm. And you mentioned people are going to criticize you for it. And I was hearing all the criticism that you were mentioning. I could hear it by the back of my mind because I know what people I know, especially what people in the Iran was in Iran who are against your position might say. So um, uh, let me know when you're done so I could tell you what. they were <laughs> Well, I, I, again, I mean, you know, obviously I, I, I'm not Iranian. I, I, I don't live in Iranian society. I, I don't I haven't lived. No on, more. On, on, I, I actually don't buy this. A lot of people think like, tell me like, oh, Army, you know, from your, uh, you're from Iran, so you know more. I like think about the average American citizen and think about how much they know about United States policy. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I know. Right? I know. So, <laughs> it, if I know about Iran, it has nothing to do. Because, uh, I mean, it has, it has something to do, but it has more to do with you know, following the events and like mm-hmm. reading about it. It's not much. Most people, in fact, maybe looking for, to Iran from outside will remove some of the bias that some people maybe, might have. Yeah. I, I mean, to me, the, the election of Khatami was, was a recognition that, and the regime, I think, realized the error of their ways. I mean, the, the people wanted Khatami to be president. He was the first really, I think, popularly elected president. I mean, you know, the Guardians Council and all the other bodies in Iran the expediency council have all these ways of, of getting people uh, or um, rejecting candidates for elections. I mean, I've seen the statistics like, you know, out of 10,000 people, like four are allowed to run kind of thing. So, you know, they make, they make up these stupid rules as to why you can't run. And when Khatami won, I, I got the impression that he truly was the, the man of the people and that he was he was welcomed and he would make a difference. And then, of course, the regime put all kinds of obstacles in his place because, as you know, Iran is a very, very, very complicated society. I remember giving a presentation on Iran in, in like 2001, before 9-11, uh, when I was working at CSIS, the security service. And I tried to explain the levels of approvals and the levels of government in Iran. And people looked at me like I had three heads. What do you mean there's like 15 councils to do this, 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 and this? <laughs> you know, in Canada, we have, we, we have parliament. That's what we have. Then we have the Senate, which nobody cares about. But, you know, we have the democratically elected parliament and they decide based on the majority government who runs the government, what the policies are. What Iran is not that simple. Yeah. You have you know, the majlis can say one thing and then the Guardians Council says, nope, we don't like that. And they, they reject it kind of thing. And then, of course, then you have the, you know, the, the, the Rahbar, the, the leader, the spiritual leader. He can decide something different. So I, I, I did think that, you know, as an outsider, I think that Khatami did represent something different. I thought he gave people hope. I thought he was a, a certainly a better representative uh, outwardly for Iran than the previous presidents had been. And at the end of the day, I think the regime basically hauled him in like they do to other things in the country. So the so, people, give, so give me your version. So well, this is not my version. This is what I hear from Iran. Uh, the, the people that are the only thing, the people from Iran who want nothing short of the collapse of the Islamic Republic, right? Um, what they say is that Khatami and Rouhani are false hope. And they're controlled opposition, right? Okay. And they're just there just to dangle in front of people like, oh, look, democracy, democracy. But at yeah. the end of the day, nothing that Khamenei doesn't want will never happen. Um, and, and basically gi- giving people like, and that we will never be fooled again. This is why in the, mm. li- the latest protests, one of the most popular chants were... Um, they were like reformist, yeah. uh, the, the fundamentalists, you're all the same, yeah. uh, get lost, your time is up, right? Um, and they also, these are the same people who hate people who support Rouhani um, now more than, you know, more than even the fundamentalists because they're like, you guys are basically giving into the system, you guys are... Yeah. The people, right. because you are making the people who are against the regime, you are basically giving them hope instead of actually making yeah. them fool. And also, yes. they they also hate Obama for cooperating with right. Khatami because they, they the only thing they want from the United States is out full on opposition against yeah. the regime, yeah. no cooperation. Well, what, but see, I see, I can understand that you've had forty years, forty one years of a theocratic government that does whatever it wants, and I can I can sense the frustration. I mean, my only my only pushback would be. I don't think Khatami was that kind of person himself. Whether he was used by the regime is a whole entirely different issue. I did think he tried to bring about change, but how do you change a system where you've got so many checks and balances? You have so many different bodies they that say can you can't. That's what they say. You can't. You well, have to topple well, you, it. Well, you can't. And I, and I don't think anybody was going to miss 
the theocratic regime of Iran, you know, if and when it actually falls. I mean, no, nobody nobody thinks it's a good idea to have this, the current system in place. The question that becomes, what's it going to take to replace it? And then we go back to our earlier question: Is it the, it will take an outside force? And we've seen historically outside forces rarely work. And then you know, do the Iranian people have enough of their own uh, wherewithal to? Uh, affect another revolution with the Pastaran and all the other people in place? Really good question, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, so this is what people who are against the toppling of regime would say, who are still against the regime but are against toppling it, their number, their go-to line is, look at what happened in Iraq, look at what happened in Syria, look at what happened in Libya. Iran is going to be another version of that if we remove the government. There's going to be civil war um for a decade and as much as i hate the islamic republic of iran i'll take that over absolute chaos that's what they say well i, I but i understand that i was in nicaragua in 1986 okay so seven years after 79 was also the year that the uh, sandinistas defeated the samosa regime in nicaragua and i was in nicaragua in 86 and at that time the sandinistas were still very very popular they were now fighting a war against the contras who ronald reagan famously said one man's freedom fighters, another man's terrorist. The conscious looked upon as freedom fighters by, by Reagan administration and as terrorists by the Nicaraguans because they killed Nicaraguans. But, you know, the Sandinistas are still in control. 41 years later in Nicaragua, you, and you find one Nicaraguan who likes the Sandinistas, but do they want to go through another Nicaraguan revolution? Which, by the way, took about 16 years for them to get rid of the dictator. Uh, you have to ask the people that question, right? What's, what's worse? The status quo or what might come after the status quo so the response to that is a bit of a i i don't i don't know i mean if you um you probably notice iranians are extremely racist against arabs right yes, yes. um and it's that, one, per, it's that person superiority thing yeah yeah the aryan superior yeah the aryan yeah. superiority okay. yeah yep. um proud aryans the iranians are um <laughs> <laughs> but what they would say is like, no, Iran would not become like Libya if the top uh, government topples because we're not like those Arabs. We have there a superior go. culture. Yeah. We will be able to maintain a civil society. And they say that all, all the problems that we have right now in Iran is because of this Arab, uh, Islam, Arab influence, um, this foreign invasion of the superior Persian culture. Once blah, we get blah, rid blah, of that, blah, blah, we... <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I, and another thing, I, I mean, I don't know if you also noticed uh, some people, some of these Aryan supremacists who used to identify as Zoroastrian instead of uh, Muslim, yes. uh, they're now cozying up to the regime because they think like it's kicking ass and it's built, bringing back the glorious Persian Empire, even though they hate Islam. They kind of are liking the Islamic Republic because they they think like we are now the tough guys in the region, and they like that. They like that that big boy, you know, the yeah. alpha, you know. You you want an interesting parallel that actually is very similar to that. Uh, a lot of Israelis love U.S. Christian fundamentalist evangelicals. Oh yeah, right? they're very strong Christian evangelical oh, yeah, support of Israel. Right. Do you know Do you know why that is? Yeah, but well, because, because the evangelicals think that Israel has to be destroyed yeah. for for Jesus Christ to come back to earth. So they they think they're useful idiots that they you know they yeah. they, 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 they the the right wing Jews are supporting the fundamentalist Christians even though the Christians think like well well Jesus comes he's going to wipe you all out exactly but they're still allies. <laughs> <laughs> well, given that Jesus is probably not coming back anytime soon, maybe they think we can we can gain some advantages now and then. In 10,000 yeah. years when Jesus comes back, I won't be alive anyways, what do I care? Well, I mean, they think like Jesus is not coming back anyway, so these Christians are delusional. We might as well just <laughs> enjoy their money and support while we can. <laughs> but you're well, right. That's and, a, that, and, if you go, and, and of course, if you go back, you know, throughout Christian history, they, I mean, they, they, many Christians held Jews responsible for the death of Jesus. This is why anti-Semitism started in the first place. You're the guys that killed our Savior. You're the guys that killed the Son of God. You rejected him as as the son of God. You said he was just a meddlesome prophet, and you crucified him. Well, actually, well, the Romans did at the behest of yeah, the Jews. Yeah, the Romans. I was going to say the uh, anti at the behest of the started. Jewish leaders, though. Yeah, right? they didn't like Jesus. So, right. um, but yeah, history history is funny sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's very it's a very interesting parallel because these um, anti-Islamic uh, 
anti-Arab racist. I mean, they are genuinely anti-Arab racist. I'm not saying anybody, who, everybody who's against Islam is mm. a racist because, I mean, I, I think we're not. But these people genuinely are. Uh, but, you know, for me, growing up, I was used to the idea that there's two groups. This was a simplified version of it. The whole fundamentalist religious pro-regime types and this nationalist pro-Iran not Islam, anti mullah pro the you know glorified Persian past part, and these were the two major uh, groups that were against each other. Now it seems like everything is more complicated. Now we have uh, the people who are against Islam, but they're supporting the regime because they are against foreign intervention and pro empire building of the regime. And we have a whole bunch of religious fundamentalists that are breaking off from the regime. Uh, and they're saying that this is not the right way of doing Shia Islam. And you have, I don't know, the whole Shirazi mullahs who's mm -hmm. saying they're backed up by the British, which is it's getting really more and more confusing. It's very interesting. But... Welcome to life. Life <laughs> is complicated. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Um, so, I mean, I... I Let's end it here. I, there are so many other things I wanted to talk to you. I wanted, to, uh, but I'm hoping you could come back because I want to talk about Syria, I'd love to come Iraq, back. Soleimani, Israel, yeah, Afghanistan. I'd love to come back. Oh yeah. Okay. Great. So before I end this, and thank you uh, so much for your time. I, I want to make, ask you where can people find you, and uh, which one of your books should they buy sure. and read? Yeah. Go ahead. All of them. They're all, all great. Them. They're all the greatest <laughs> books yes. ever written. I'm um, sure, yes. No. So, I, so there's a couple of ways people can find me. So my website is www.borealisthreatenedrisk.com. So Borealis is B-O-R-E-A-L-I-S. It refers to the Northern Lights here in Canada. That's what my company's called, Borealis. So I go to the website. All my podcasts are there, all my blogs, all my interviews, etc. cetera. Thank you, can you also, description. Yeah. You can also find me uh, on Twitter, at Borealis Saves. It's actually... Uh, it's a bit of a pun because I, I run my consulting firm, so I'm trying to save people. I'm also I also play goalie in hockey, although I don't save many pucks. I'm very bad, but it's a pun on my my my, my goaltending uh, lack of ability. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook, and uh, yeah. So that yeah. So the five books I've written, 2015 was called The Threat from Within, looking at radicalization. Uh, 2016 was the uh, Western Foreign Fighters, why Canadians and Westerners were joining Islamic State. 2017 was the lesser jihads, looking at different jihads around the world. Now that Islamic State was, was the caliphate had fallen. Uh, book number four was an end to the war on terrorism, where I argued that the term war on terrorism is really, really stupid. And we got to stop calling it a war. Uh, and the last book was what we discussed earlier was When Religion Kills. And that came out in 2019. Yeah, I think our audience would be very interested in that but when religion kills, because we have an atheist uh, audience, so when religion kills might be one of the interesting ones for them. But I'll, if I link to your website, is the link to your social media and your books on your website? Yes, everything's okay. there, yeah. Okay, so I link to people check the, the description yeah, for the you. link to your website. Uh, I know, yeah, follow follow him on all social media because this is like uh, you you can't get better content uh, on these stuff. Uh, you know, you're you're. Um, you know, it's very impressive. Don't let people tell you that you shouldn't have these opinions. Uh, I, I, <laughs> oh, no. I, have, I, have, I have the feeling that a lot of people have told you that you're not from Iran, so why are you even talking? Like, that, <laughs> right? Like, but that is such... I can tell you. I, I'll tell you that I have spoken to many, many Iranians who are very active uh, online when it comes to political activism, and you, uh, your knowledge on the subject is more than... Most of them come by. Well, thank you. That's very yeah. kind of you. <laughs> right. The only, uh, thing, also, the, only, the, yeah. the only thing I don't, I, I, I don't use the term expert because um, everybody's an expert today, which means nobody's an expert. I don't like the term expert because it doesn't have any meaning anymore. Uh, so I, I don't like to, to be called that. Uh, call me a specialist. Call me a former intelligence. Call me an author, whatever. But I, 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 the term expert is meaningless as far as I'm concerned these days, unfortunately. Okay. Also, by the way, shout out to Vikram for introducing me to you. I'm shouting out because uh, he's helping me a lot, so I just want to shout out to Vikram. Cool. But again, so um, so you promised us here that you're going to come I back. I did promise you to come back. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> and we'll, we'll talk about when that when that's going to happen. Sounds good. Okay, great. Thank you again. Thank you for your okay, time. Okay, you're welcome. Hold office. Hold office. <laughs>